Today we're going to take a look at the female reproductive system. Purpose, structure, and function will all be discussed today. So one of the characteristics of life that we learn is that living organisms must reproduce. So in most species, the female takes care of that particular function. Not only will new offspring be born, but maintained existence, continued existence of the genetic code of that species will happen through reproduction. Males and females usually differ in the fact that females will provide protection and nutrition to developing offspring for, at least in a human's case, for several years. The structural plan has the same type of categories as those of a male. There are essential organs and there are accessory organs. In the male system, we saw that the essential organ was the gonad, the testes, and the accessory organs were a set of ducts that contributed chemicals to sperm. In the female, the gonads are the ovaries, the essential organs of reproduction. Those ovaries will produce sex cells as well. They will produce eggs, or we refer to them as ova. The accessory organs for a female are not only internal genitalia, but external genitalia. So the three types of internal genitalia that fall under the category of accessory organs are the uterine tubes, which are also referred to as fallopian tubes. Um, you'll sometimes even hear them as oviducts. The uterus, the uterus is here. It provides a place for implantation of a fertilized egg. The vagina is the entryway for sperm into the female reproductive system. So the internal genitalia then are ducts or duct-like structures that extend from the ovaries to the exterior. We also mentioned that the other accessory organs were the external genitalia, which we'll collectively refer to as the vulva. Additionally, sex glands such as mammary glands of the breast can also be considered an accessory organ of the female reproductive system. Here we see the basic anatomy of the female reproductive system. We have the external genitalia on the outside here. We said that was collectively referred to as the vulva. And we also have the uh, pathway to the essential organs for sperm. So sperm will enter through the vagina and they will collectively start their journey to the uterus through the opening here called the cervix. They'll travel into the uterus searching for an egg and they will go down the fallopian tube or the, uh, ov uh, the oviducts. There are two, one on the left side, one on the right side, and eventually if an egg is released from the essential organ here, which is the ovary, it will travel down the oviduct and the two may meet up in the case of a successful fertilization event. If we take a look at the ovaries, their structure and their location, they're almond-shaped nodular glands. They're located on each side of the uterus, below and behind the uterine tubes. Distal uterine tubes curve over the top of the ovaries and finger-like fimbriae cover over them. So down here we have kind of a cross section going on of the ovary. The front face has been removed and you can see there's a number of structures in the inside which we will talk about. The fimbriae are these structures right here. These are like little fingers of the fallopian tubes that are going to help to sweep the egg down this direction here. Occasionally, eggs will be released and they miss their target and they wind up somewhere in this location outside of the uterine tubes. If the sperm make it all the way up and fertilize in an event outside of the normal tract, we call that an ectopic pregnancy. So that can be very problematic because the normal place for fertilization should be in this region, not outside here. Here is another look of the female reproductive system. 
And again, uh, what we have here is uh, kind of a view where we have a cross section of the ovary. So here we're taking a peek inside of one. Here's the uterine tube. And instead of a very large you know, opening, there's a very small convoluted lumen, um, but it is big enough for a egg to pass through. At its thinnest point, uh, you could probably say it's about the width of a human hair. Getting inside the ovary, we can take a look at the overall structure. And just like the kidney, there is an inner portion and an outer portion. And we use terms like cortex and medulla to describe inner and outer portions. Cortex is the outer and medulla is the inner portion of many structures in the body. Epithelium will cover the cortex. Embedded in the interior of the cortex are ovarian follicles containing immature oogonia. Oogonia are going to be our female sex cells, and they're nourished by a set of cells on the outside called the follicles. And in this picture here, you can see a number of them in the outer area of the cortex. The medulla on the inside contains tissue cells, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. This is a picture of the ovary, the in internal structures of the ovary, and the events that occur during a typical month. So we'll start down here at the bottom of the ovary where you see the primary follicles. And what happens every month is a few hundred of these primary follicles will attempt to become an egg that will be released from the ovary. Usually only one will win, however many will try the ones that don't make it will be reabsorbed into the ovary. On their pathway to become a released egg, you will see cells called granulosa cells begin to increase in number and divide in the outer layers of those primary follicles. One function that they have will be to secrete estrogen-rich fluid into the bloodstream of the ovary, which will be connected to the rest of the female body. As the development continues, you can see that there is a size increase, and you can see that there is now a fluid-filled chamber called an antrum that develops as well. Next, size continues to increase, and the follicle will actually uh, bump up against the outside of the ovary and you can see th through the side of the ovary this developing follicle. Remember this happens in less than 15 days. When it is considered mature we give it the name of graphene follic follicle and this contains the oocyte that will be released or the egg that will be released to the outside which occurs during ovulation. Another thing that grows around the oocyte itself is a zona pellucida, which is a set of cells um, that are going to come in contact with sperm if the two should meet. During ovulation, which happens around day 14 of a monthly cycle, females can exhibit what's called mittelschmerz, which means middle pain. So some females will actually feel the outside of their ovary rupture every month and that is the name that's given to that small pain that um, happens um, that signifies ovulation has occurred. What's left of the follicle will turn into a structure called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will not only secrete estrogen as we saw with the uh, primary follicle but it will also secrete the hormone progesterone. Both of these hormones serve a very particular function which we'll get to in a little while. Over time, this corpus luteum will begin to de degenerate between days 16 and the end of the cycle at day 28 if there is no fertilization event that occurs. So after that, you can see that the middle has kind of collapsed upon itself, and this is one of the events that happens during degeneration. And then finally, we have um, the degenerated corpus luteum which will then be reabsorbed at the end of the month if there is no fertilization event. Here are some real pictures of what ovarian follicles look like. 
you can see the developing O site right here. Here's the nucleus in the center and the zona pellucida on the outside. There is a cast of supporting cells that will help to nourish and protect the developing oocyte. And in the second picture, you see the developing antrum, which is that fluid-filled cavity that exists outside of the follicle walls. There are essential organs that produce sperm cells in both males and females. And we've already said that in the case of the female, it is the ovary. The process for producing those gametes is called oogenesis. After ovulation, the ovum or egg will move into the uterine tube where it will be fertilized by a sperm. Ovaries are also endocrine organs that secrete hormones, which we mentioned in that cross-sectional diagram. One is progesterone and the other one is estrogen. So the ovaries serve many different functions. To focus in on that first function, oogenesis, this is the overall name which we give the process by which oogonia become mature ova. During the fetal period is when the majority of this happens. Mitosis will produce half a million primary oocytes from oogonia. They'll begin their life and then they will arrest at a particular stage of meiosis called prophase 1. They'll just halt their progress right there before birth. Now, it's not until puberty reaches till that process will continue again. So they're kind of just in a holding pattern within the ovary from birth forward. During childhood, those primary oocytes will develop outer granulosa cells and become those primary follicles. Once puberty begins, a number of primary oocytes will resume meiosis. The numbers vary uh, between 500 and 1,000, and they'll migrate toward the surface of the ovary. A secondary oocyte, as well as the first polar body, are then formed. The polar body will then degenerate. One of the things that happens during meiosis is what we call a reductional division, where the genetic content will actually be cut in half. The cell that will not be used to form an ova or egg will become a polar body and it will degenerate and be reabsorbed by the ovary. At the end of development, between days 1 and day 13 to 14, only one oocyte will mature enough for ovulation. The rest will be reabsorbed. Meiosis again will then halt at metaphase 2 of meiosis. So there's two stopping points of the meiotic process within the one egg that will be released. Meiosis will come to completion later if the head of a sperm does enter the ovum. This picture here is a generalized overview of what happens during oogenesis. So, before birth, there are a number of cells within the ovary called oogonium. And through mitotic divisions, they will become many oogonia. There will be a number of cells, usually about a half a million of them. They will develop outer cells around the oogonia. They'll, in other words, they'll grow and they'll differentiate a little bit to become what's known as a primary oocyte. These are diploid cells. So they have two sets of chromosomes. They will halt during meiosis one during prophase. Prophase is a time when the chromosomes come together. They find their, uh, the maternal and paternal chromosomes will find their same chromosome partner and they'll begin an event called crossing over. After birth and once puberty begins, those primary oocytes will turn into secondary oocytes. Meiosis continues and one polar body will be discarded. If the secondary oocyte is fertilized, then meiosis II will continue and the second polar body will release and degenerate. However, you will have now an ovum that has been fertilized. Meiosis will continue 
and if all goes successfully, you will then have a diploid offspring. The uterus is an upside down pear shaped organ that has two parts. The wide upper part is called the body and the top bulge is called the fundus. The lower end neck is called the cervix. So if we take a look at the various structures here, sperm enter through the vagina and there is a mucus plug that sits at the end of the uterus um, right at the cervix position and during the time of ovulation this mucus plug will become more liquefied which will allow sperm if present to travel through up into the uterus and try to find going in both directions an egg that has been released from the ovary. The walls of the uterus are very thick with uh, thick with muscle in order to help expel a baby if the female becomes pregnant. So the layers of the uterus, there are three, begin from the inside with an inter, inner endometrial layer, which is a lining of mucous membrane. It has rich vascularity and it will secrete mucus. So on the diagram here, it is this thinnest layer here on the inside. If an egg is fertilized, this is the place of implantation, the endometrial layer of the uterus. The second layer, the thick side walls, are called myometrium. The muscles that make up the myometrium have multi-directional layering. They're very strong, so when they contract, they can help expel a fetus. So the functions of the uterus then is first to provide a track for sperm to ascend towards the uterine tube for fertilization. The endometrial surface will, surface will provide an environment for implantation of a fertilized egg and continue its development through gestation. It provides a place for nutrient waste exchange in developing offspring. So if the female does become pre pregnant, the placenta will be implanted there. Myometrial rhythmic contractions will help push a baby out. And myometrial contractions will also aid and assist menstruation where the sloughing off of the endometrial layer happens. The uterine tubes, which are connected to the uterus, they're also no, called fallopian tubes or oviducts. We mentioned that before. They're attached to the uterus at its upper outer angles here and extend upward and outward towards the sides of the pelvis. Notice that they wrap around and they end in structures here, which kind of cup the ovaries, and these were called fimbriae, which aid in sweeping the egg into those fallopian tubes. So the function of the uterine tubes then is to serve as transport channels for ova and is the site of fertilization. So if a fertilization event does happen, it's not here where implantation occurs. Typically it's anywhere in this region here in the uterine tube because the egg has already been swept down this way and the sperm will be coming this way and the two will meet somewhere in the uterine tube. The structure of the uterine tube will consist of mucus, smooth muscle, and serous lining. The mucu mucosal lining is directly continuous with the peritoneal lining the pelvic cavity. So in this area right here, um, this is basically very thin membrane and that will also continue on within the uterine tubes. Remember there is a left and a right uterine tube. There are three divisions of every uterine tube. There is the infundibulum, which has the fimbriae or those finger-like projections that will sweep an egg down into the tube. There's the ampulla region, ampullary region, and there's also the ismuth region, which is very thin. Um, as thin as a human hair. Now the interior of the uterine tubes, the fallopian tubes, they are not round lumen. You can see it's folded in a variety of ways here, but it is ciliated. And those cilia are going to sweep downward towards the uterus this way, so the egg will go in the right direction and hopefully 
implant in the proper area, which would be the uterine wall. The vagina is the entry point for sperm involved uh, in reproduction. So it's a tubular organ. It's located between the rectum, urethrum, and bladder. The structure of the vagina is a collapsible tube capable of distension, composed of smooth muscle lined with mucous membrane and arranged in rugae. Rugae are folds. We saw uh, rugae also in the stomach that allowed it to distend. And the anterior wall is shorter than the posterior wall because the cervix protrudes into its uppermost portion. So what that means is there can actually be a little bit of a collection spot here for sperm to pool and then begin their tr uh, trip into the uterus looking for an egg. So the, uh, the functions of vagina then are to lubricate and stimulate the penis during sexual intercourse and acts as a receptacle for semen. It's the lower portion of the birth canal and it transports tissue and bloodshed during menstruation to the exterior. The accessory organs, the breast, lie over the pectoral muscles. Both estrogen and progesterone, two of the ovarian hormones, will control breast development during puberty. Estrogen will stimulate the growth of mammary ducts. Progesterone will stimulate the development of actual secreting glands. So when progesterone goes into the bloodstream, what will happen then is that the glands will develop and possibly if receiving a message from a different hormone called prolactin they will begin to secrete milk. The estrogen stimulated the growth of mammary ducts which the milk will then pass through for a suckling baby. The mechanism of lactation happens because of the loss of the placenta after birth. That will result in decrease of estrogen and stimulate the hormone prolactin from the pituitary gland. That will stimulate lact lactation as well as suckling. Suckling by the baby will also stimulate the posterior pituitary to secrete oxytocin, which stimulates breast alveoli to eject milk. Lactation can provide nutrient-rich milk to offspring for up to several years from birth. It will also provide passive immunity from antibodies present in milk and provides an emotional link between the mother and the child. So here we kind of have a flow chart showing what suckling will do. Um, first, it stimulates the anterior pituitary to secrete prolactin and that will stimulate the breast alveoli to secrete the milk. The other thing it will do is stimulate the posterior pituitary gland to produce oxytocin, which stimulates the breast alveoli to eject milk from the ducts, which the infant can then remove it. So one produces the milk, and one allows the milk to be ejected so the baby can successfully suckle. Next, we'll take a look at the ovarian cycle. And we mentioned that anywhere from 500 to 1,000 of those primary follicles will resume meiosis from prophase. And from day 1 to day 13, you can see there is a gradual increase in size of the follicle. There is the growth of what we said was an antrum, this fluid-filled chamber here. And eventually, this vesicular follicle will rupture the side of the ovary, releasing the egg, and the egg will travel down the fallopian tube. What's left in the ovary is the structure called the corpus luteum, and it will regress until it becomes what's known as a corpus albicans. And at that point, um, and during the month, that corpus albicans will cause menstruation to occur, which you see down here in the uteral lining diagram. So the menstrual cycle, including the ovarian cycle, it will begin, we'll call day one through five, the menstrual phase where the uterine lining is sloughed off. During the proliferative phase, or the follicular stage, we see that uterine lining grows. And it grows much taller as the days of the month continue. And why this uterine lining is growing is so it can provide a place for implantation of a fertilized cells, a fertilized cell. <clears throat> if there's no fertilization event, Again, at the end of the month, it will slough off.
during menstruation. During the menstrual cycle, also referred to as the endometrial cycle, because it is the endometrial layer that we're talking about, the superficial layer of the endometrium sloughs off during menstruation. Usually clotting will not occur, and the discharge averages a volume from 30 to 100 milliliters. After menstruation, the cells of the endometrium will then again proliferate, and the endometrium grows 2 to 3 millimeters by ovulation. And after ovulation, the endometrial layer will grow another 2 to 3 millimeters as well. And it does so in case there's the uh, chance of a fertilized egg being implanted. So here we can see a different type of view of the menstrual cycle itself. And uh, let's go ahead and kind of break down what's happening here. So <clears throat> during menstruation, we see a return to the shortest levels of tissue within the endometrial layer. So this would be our menstruation event right here. After the menstruation, and this would be days one through five, after the menstruation event, you'll then see the uterine lining once again grow. So the endometrial layer will start growing again 2 to 3 millimeters by the time of ovulation, which is day 13. So we could say this, um, sorry, day 14. This, this is day 6 through 13. After ovulation, you can see that the endometrial layer continues to grow until it gets to a height, uh, a maximal height right here at about day 26, 27. Um, so after day 25, we then see a gradual decrease once again of height of that endometrial layer. What's happening is what's, these arterioles, which are providing nutrients for this growing tissue, is going to constrict. These arterioles will shut down and when they shut down, there's no more blood nutrients to nourish this tissue. And that will be the same tissue that winds up being sloughed off from the endometrial layer at the start of the menstrual cycle. So what causes this is a drop in progesterone. One of the structures inside of that ovary, the one called the corpus luteum, will stop producing progesterone as it reaches the end of the month. That triggers those endometrial arteries to constrict. The local cells go ischemic. So this is no longer producing nutrients, and the death of the tissue will happen. So we have four phases of the menstrual cycle then. We have menses, which occurs on days one through five. Um, that's menstruation. We have the post-menstrual stage, and that occurs between menses and ovulation, days six through 13. <clears throat> Has some other names as well, the pre-ovulatory stage. That makes sense because ovulation hasn't happened yet estrogenic phase that makes sense because the follicle as it develops gives off estrogen and the follicular phase because within the ovary in day one through 13 you have a follicle developing ovulation is pretty universal day 14 premenstrual would be the period between ovulation and menses so here we'll be talking days 15 through 28 days Oh, there we go, 15 through 28. Uh, that would also be the called the post-ovulatory stage, and that makes sense because ovulation happened on day 14. The luteal phase, because our corpus luteum has taken over within the, within the ovary after the egg left. And then progesterone stage, because the corpus luteum secretes progesterone. Multiple events will occur during the menstrual cycle. And since this is complicated and interconnected, we'll take our time and we'll go through these one at a time. From the perspective of the anterior pituitary, what we see is what sticks out most, I should say, is this big spike in the middle. But let's go ahead and instead we'll focus on what occurs right before the beginning of the stage. Notice that follicle stimulating hormone, this orange curve, which kind of parallels with this red curve for luteinizing hormone, except right here in this big spot. They're both on the increase right here. And what that's going to do is it's going to be a, a trigger, a chemical trigger that tells the ovary to start producing um, follicles once again, to eventually um, produce a follicle that will release its egg during ovulation. So what comes from 
a gland inside of your brain will tell the reproductive system to release follicles and begin their maturation process. Now, as days 1 through 13 happen, you see there's a little bit of growth in LH. It dips back down a little bit before day 14. And you see a, a, a tampering down of the follicle-stimulating hormone because we don't need any more follicles. We're working on the 1 as, it, as uh, time is going on here. But at day 14... Because of an estrogen spike, we have what's called an LH surge. And that's what that big spike is up here. And that causes, um, that is going to happen directly before, and it correlates with the release of the egg from the side of the ovary. After the LH surge, it goes back down to low levels once again, and then it begins a steady climb in the latter part of the month. And again, when it reaches the end and there's no fertilization event, it's going to go ahead and cause the release of more follicles the next month. <clears throat> as far as the ovary is concerned, um, we're going to see the follicle develop through days 1 through 13. The follicle will reach the side of the ovary. It will grow much larger in size to become a mature follicle or a graphene follicle. <coughs> Excuse me. And then at day 14... The ovary will then ovulate, the egg comes out, and what's left over from the follicle will become the corpus luteum, which is this structure here, which will then produce progesterone. As you can see, this purple curve goes up. So remember, I said all these stages, all these events are interconnected, and that's uh, what provides the complexity for this female reproductive monthly uh, cycle system. As the month continues, the corpus luteum will regress and it eventually become what's known as a corpus albicans. And at that point, progesterone and estrogen will completely drop off in production. And that will be the trigger <clears throat> which causes menstruation to happen. So it's kind of like um, we're following one at a time and working ourselves down here. So this last, um, oh sorry, uh, this third tier of this particular diagram is the ovarian hormones. You can see as the follicle develops, there's more and more estrogen production until it reaches its peak, which triggers off the LH surge. And it's not until that happens when we have a corpus luteum do we see the progesterone secretion skyrocket and reach high levels. Now, these two hormones here, by shutting down and by losing production of them, that's going to cause the arterioles within the uterine lining to constrict, and that extra length that was grown on the endometrial layer will then be sloughed off, and will start again down at 2 to 3 millimeters. <clears throat> During the follicular phase, we see uh, steady growth all the way up until day 22 or 23, and slowly, if there's no fertilization event, you'll see a decrease in this, and then finally, those two hormones will cause a massive decrease, causing menstruation to happen. If we really take a look at the gonadotropic cycle, the cycle that dealt with the hormones from the pituitary, um, we can focus in on the LH surge that occurs and its correlation with the release of the, uh, of the egg during ovulation. LH, the ovulating hormone, will trigger progesterone secretion from the corpus luteum. So it's because of this event that happens here that this corpus luteum is going to start to secrete progesterone. And what we'll see is the maintenance of the uterine lining being very thick with higher progesterone le levels. Increasing follicle stimulating hormone the uh, other <clears throat> pituitary hormone causes two events to happen. It's going to stimulate primary follicles to start growing. So we said that, you know, the name itself, follicle stimulating hormone, tells you that it's starting up a new round and it wants to produce another egg in the next month for possibility of a fertilization event. It will also increase the estrogen secretion by the follicles. So as that follicle develops, the cells that uh, make up the follicle will then secrete estrogen. And estrogen will also have an effect on the uterine, uterus by causing the walls <clears throat> to thicken up. So I have a summary here. Um, in general, hormones control cyclical changes. The changes in the ovaries result from changes in the gonadotropins, and they're secreted by the pituitary. 
The cyclical changes in the uterus are caused by changes in estrogen and progesterone. <clears throat> Low levels of FSH and LH cause regression of the corpus luteum if pregnancy does not occur. This causes a decrease in estrogen and progesterone, which triggers endometrial sloughing of the menstrual phase. So there is a lot of interconnection here. It's a very complex process. Um, it takes a lot of read-throughs and a lot of focus to understand how one thing affects another and how there's negative feedback loops in play as well. The control of cyclical, uh, excuse me, cyclical changes in gonadotropin secretion is caused by positive and fe negative feedback mechanisms and involves estrogen, progesterone, and the hypothalamus secretion of releasing hormones. Hormones play a role in the transition from childhood to puberty. We saw that in the male when we went over the male reproductive system. It's during that time where we saw um, an increased production of testosterone, which had all kinds of physical effects on the male. Well, we see the same thing happen with puberty in females. The pituitary gland will begin to secrete FSH, which signals the ovaries to begin producing estrogen. And because of that, many physical changes will happen in response. Breast growth, hair growth, menstruation, growth, weight gain, skin, emotional changes, all as a result of estrogen and progesterone now becoming part of the normal chemistry of the female. A fertilization event will typically occur in the outer one-third of the oviduct. So it happens in the fallopian tubes, not in the uterus. The zona pellucida, and this is the outer layer of the egg, will attract sperm and lock onto sperm with receptor proteins. So a lot of attraction in biology is chemical, and even the egg with its zona pellucida will attract sperm towards itself and then allow the sperm to lock on to that zona pellucida with special proteins embedded in that uh, structure. We mentioned during the male reproductive system, there was an acrosomal cap, which means that on the tip of each sperm, there was a, an enzyme or, or a chemical that releases hydrolytic enzymes that will break down that zona. And that will allow the sperm to reach the surface of the egg, the ovum, and their plasma membranes could then fuse. Once inside the egg cell, the nuclear content of the sperm head will combine with the eggs as well as some RNA as well. So down here, we see a number of sperm, which are currently all trying to get in the egg. However, there will just be one, one winner, and it's going to wiggle its way through the outer membrane of the cell and then release the contents of its head on the inside. Once a sperm does make it into the ovum, the ovum will then release enzymes that deactivate surface receptor proteins, which receive and bind to sperm. So it puts up almost like a force field to stop any more additional sperm from getting in. It becomes a fertilization membrane, now impenetrable to other sperm. The sperm will add 23 chromosomes to the ovum, which also has 23, and now you have 46. You have 23 pairs of maternal and paternal chromosomes. And we now refer to the cell as a fertilized cell, or zygote. Implantation will occur, we said, at the uterine wall. So once a zygote is formed, once the cell has been fertilized, it's going to start to, to divide. And it's going to go through a couple stages before it actually implants. First, it becomes a morula. A morula is a ball of cells. It's a solid ball. And that from that first cell, you're going to have mitotic divisions. Um, one cell will go into two, two into four four into eight, so forth and so on. So it's going to grow pretty fast. It will stay spherical and it will be in this particular stage for about three days. After three days, a blastocyst will then develop, which comes from the same morula, except now there's a cavity on the inside and the inner cell mass begins to grow. So for about 10 days, this fertilized, what started out as a fertilized cell, turned into a morula, and now it's a blastocyst, is floating down, back down the fallopian tube to wind up in the uterus and maybe implant on the uterine wall. 
The ovum has a store of nutrients that support embryonic development until implantation has occurred. So here is kind of an overview of those events that happened. Day 14, we saw the rupture of the egg uh, from the follicle. The fimbriae will sweep up that egg into the right location, which is to float down the uterine tube. In the outer one-third here, we have a fertilization event. The first mitosis will happen after the DNA arranges itself in this fertilized cell. So you have one cell turn into two, two into four, four into eight, so forth and so on, until you reach the blastocyst stage. <clears throat> Once the blastocyst makes it into the uterus, we then see implantation into the uterine wall, into the endometrial layer, which should now be pretty thick because that happens around day 25, um, which is the thickest, well, I should say day 24, 25, which is the thickest the, the endometrial layer can be. Here is a look inside of that fertilized cell from the first event forward, and we have the sperm entering the cell. We see uh, polar bodies being formed as excess chromosomes are no longer needed. The chromosomes wind up in the middle, and they're going to separate, making one cell into two cells, four, eight, so forth and so on. You go from memoria to the blastocyst. And here we see implantation into the uterine wall. You see a couple of embryonic tissues start developing. You see a yolk sac, an amniotic cavity. And with a little bit more development, we have now an embryonic disc that happens in between the yolk sac and the amniotic cavity. We also see a developing chorion, which is going to be the basis for our placenta uh, connection very soon. The placenta anchors the fetus to the uterus and provides a bridge for the exchange of nutrients and waste products between the mother and the baby. It will serve as an excretory, respiratory, and endocrine organ. So all of the developing fetus's um, systems and physiology will be handled by the mother's system. Placental tissue normally separates maternal and fetal blood supply. So we should not have a mixing of female, uh, the female's blood supply with the baby's blood supply. <clears throat> the placenta is also an endocrine gland because it's going to secrete a large amount of human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG. By secreting HCG, that will stimulate the corpus luteum to continue its secretion of estrogen and progesterone, which keeps the uterine lining thick, which it needs to be to support the connection between the mother and a baby. Here, we see a blown up um, kind of little portion of how the baby is connected to the mother's uterine wall. Notice that there are um, capillaries here called chorionic villi, um, which are from the baby, and the mother's maternal arterioles and venules are here. So they are going to provide the exchange location for nutrients and waste between the mother and baby without the actual blood cells um, being exchanged. This final graph here shows the actions of the placenta working as an endocrine gland secreting, at first, human chorionic gonadotropin right here in large amounts. And meanwhile, the ovary is producing progesterone and estrogen to keep the uterine wall thick. That's after one month. After four months, you still see human chorionic gonadotropin being secreted, but now the placenta is also secreting progesterone and estrogen, again, keeping the uterine wall thick. Meanwhile, the amount that the ovary is putting out is much less. Once a baby is full term, human kinetic, uh, chorionic gonadotropin has gone way down in production. However, progesterone and estrogen are way up. And the ovaries stop producing their own supply because the placenta has taken over. So I hope this helped you understand the basics of the female reproductive system. It is complex. It is complicated. But with enough review and reading and, and focus and time, it will make sense. If you have any questions, be sure to ask me in class. 
And um, I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye.